The year was 2019. Stress Level Zero releases a new title for virtual reality having the most advanced physics than any other. But it had a catch, and it was all in locomotion. Get out of here Half-Life Alex, the chat is here and it's called... Now this video is all about Boneworks. I mean, the real Boneworks. Gameplay, levels, story and lore, and so much more. Let us dive in. We started with a cutscene of somebody hacking into MythOS's virtual world using a Gamma U device, being the primary rival between them and Monogon. This is not the first time we've seen Gamma, we've seen them before in other Stress Level Zero games, like in Duck Season. We also see Sabre Lake, which is a security firm which works both with Monogon and Gammon, but will have a behind the scenes role in this game. And to clarify, uh, Monogon Industries is the company that made the virtual world MythOS, which is what we're primarily going to be talking about. Now for the real groundbreaking game to begin, having to work a 9 to 7 job. Archiving and disposing of items to be used in the new MythOS. This gives you the basic mechanics like what I call grab force, while well, doing the sorting of the objects. <laughs> if you correctly archive the items, you unlock a room that I'll talk about in its due time. Then the game in USB shows up. When interacted with it, it completely disappears. We are now free to explore your new world as Arthur Ford. For the protagonist, you'll be playing for out the story. Ford wandering from room to room, but the first sign of oddities was when inside the break room, when a pulse stops all the clocks. In the alley, the system goes into quarantine as the blast doors block our path, forcing us to make a detour. The grid walls you see before you will remove any objects passing through it, as if deleted from the game folder. And that's the first level. It's not really a tutorial as in other games, but the game stops being a tutorial after a museum. By that stage you would have experienced just how to properly play a game. So that's after level 3. I included the main menu since I've spent a lot of time just playing around in it. In the main menu there are a lot of things to find. If you climb on top of the screen there's a hidden hatch. It tells you it will erase your save data starting all over again and the funny thing is is they blocked it off because people pressed it and got upset because it did what it said. But if you really want to delete your saves, you can still rip off the open the hatch and delete it. There is even a room, like the one we see in the cutscene. Back to the break room level. There is a surveillance log clipboard indicating that Ford has been watched and his suspicious behaviours have been noticed by his superiors. The information shows a log of what Fords have done just moments ago. Showing the range of the surveillance and probably know about his contact with Gammon and modified headset as he entered MythOS. A laptop that shows what happens when I run Boneworks on my laptop. And the best thing of all time in this game, a radio which has a kick-ass song. I bet you every time I found one of these radios, I would be drawn to it like a moth to a flame. Carrying it throughout the level, jamming to its tunes. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. The museum is one of the perfect areas to explain what Boneworks is. From first glance, Boneworks is a virtual reality, semi-linear, first-person action puzzle game with a heavy focus on physics and full body immersion. But underneath, it's so much more than that. So I'll sign up why Boneworks bones work. Help! My bones aren't working! Boneworks stands out from a lot of other games in the sense that you have, well, a body. When you look at your hand, it's not just floating there like you're playing Rayman VR. When you hold out your arm, you will see, well, your arm, and 
you have a hand and everything else is attached to it. I know, groundbreaking stuff. This is when I understood the real meaning of bone rip, because when I got my arm stuck. I couldn't leave, I was limited to what the rest of my body was doing. I can't just phase through the wall, which limits you to the virtual reality instead of no oh. clipping to the back rooms. Oh. oh, no, 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 no. With these groundbreaking achievements, you can now successfully ram yourself into objects. I know, what a time to be living in. But wait, unlike Half-Life Alex, everything has physics, meaning you can interact with everything. This allows players to solve the problems given to them in different ways. You want to climb a ladder with a crowbar? Block projectiles with a trash can lid. You can approach the game in so many ways using real world logic to solve the in-game solutions. I do have to give Half-Life Alex props for having mean lean physics. 10 out of 10. Way better than Boneworks with that. Like how would you get in here? You could move the ramp over and find the battery to enter. Or you could use this box to climb up and smash through the window. Or even you can get on top of the building and fall through the ceiling like a boss. Ah, my legs! Don't get me wrong, player choice is not new, but Bonewix takes the player freedom and cranks up to 11 and also, well it's VR. You know how I was talking about everything having physics? Well, you clip through the screen here in the main menu. 0 out of 10, worst game, that's it, I'm out. The entire game is in locomotion, meaning when you move around you will be moving along with the model, like in real life. It's heavily immersive to have it this way instead of teleporting around in a blink of an eye. I found it hilarious in the museum when it came across the movement exhibit. They had teleportation as a primitive way of movement. At the dawn of our virtual world, many early inhabitants found themselves limited by the primitive concepts of short-range world locution. But one thing I used to find, and many others when first playing, is locomotion is very motion sickening. You can become adjusted to motion sickness, but it just requires a bit of practice. All I can say is if you start feeling unwell while playing, is to stop, have a break, drink some water, and if this helps me, is I have a fan blowing while I'm playing. These will help because there's no point in keep playing if you aren't feeling well, because you won't enjoy the experience while doing it. But that's the problem with VR, is the movement for the newer players. Games like Beat Saber, The Lab, and so on are great because there's no indirect movement to the player. The worst thing you can do in a VR game is to move the character without them having any control. One of the worst ideas in VR is roller coasters. It's just basically hell. You, you can't control the directions and you just have to endure the sheer torture. When you become adjusted to the movement, it's honestly a lot of fun. There's a little section about jumping. I don't know many VR games that have a jump button. Why use your legs to jump when you can use a stick to do it for you? The best part is, is if you think of something, you could probably do it. Damn it, why is it not working? The entire museum level made me feel like a kid exploring something new. Like as if I'm on a grand tour of the magical chocolate factory. Experiencing things for the first time, or things I have seen but done better. Jump, crouch, play it safe, go fast, up, down, climb a tube, use physics and geometry, climb another tube, damn, they like tubes, swing down using a crowbar, the possibilities are basically endless. You can climb objects that won't let you physically grab onto it, but by merely touching the floor with your real world head, allowing you to push yourself up onto any surface. While you might be having the time of your life climbing, your legs just hang there lifeless while doing so. Between the glass exhibits and interactive exhibits, there's a hidden room, the archival room. Should be locked normally. But to unlock it at the very start of the game, when you were archiving, just throw all the items given to you into the archiving bin. After doing so, you should see all three items indicating you've done it correctly. Regardless, if you follow Clippy's advice, we can see Clippy regret it later as he is trapped in the display case, not able to fulfill his dreams, trapped here, in agony. Now, to access the room, you just push it open when entering the archival room and you get amazing items and some lore. I'll explain later the importance of collecting these items. 
Now it's for our very first puzzle, and it's actually very simple in design. The most easy and common way to do it, pull this out and release the bridge, and move the platform over here. Walk up and do a few jumps, dragging yourself along the wall. Walk up here, do a few jumps. Use your body weight to bring the platform down and lock it. Then a few more jumps and now you can ascend to the next area. I later learned that you can skip most of this by releasing the bridge and jumping across the gap to the button straight away. Now if you want to save even more time, you could use the lifting force of the bridge to sling yourself onto the platform with only using the sledgehammer. When doing my research, I found a lot, I mean a lot of players, even game journalists that can't make it through it. This is basically a tutorial on getting motion sick and telling everyone how bad the game is because it's too hard. Kind of reminds me of how the game journalists couldn't even complete the very first jump in the Cuphead tutorial. Don't get me wrong, Boneworks is an advanced game for expert players and it only tells you this in the trailer, the store page, every time you launch the game and pretty much it, it makes sure that you know of that until you get annoyed and turn it off using the key in the main menu. But you can't call a game bad just because it's too hard or not made for you. Like you can't play a hardcore game like Dark Souls and expect it to be a breeze in a park. You know, you are going to get beaten down. There are games that are unfairly hard to play, you know, like living. But for game journalists, stop at this puzzle telling everyone the game's too hard and bad without even giving it more than a few minutes. You could at least look up how to make it past this bit so you can experience the rest Boneworks has to offer. But nah, game bad. Into the next area teaches us about the inventory, history of Monogon, archiving and unlocking items and a bit more. Boneworks inventory menu is dope. It's creative and very effective for this game, giving you only 5 slots for items for which forces you to make the hard decisions of carrying this long range rifle or another brick. The way it's laid out also applies to in-game model and corresponds to where you are reached to store or equip them. These items are physically stored on you and will randomly obstruct your vision if big enough and will give you a jump scare when you're walking down a scary tunnel. The five slots aren't all interchangeable. The two top ones are located on each shoulder, two side holsters on your chest, and your one butt pocket so you can stick it up your ass. The shoulder and butt pocket can store big and small objects, but the side holsters can only store small objects. Small objects are usually things like cups, keys, bricks, knives, pistols, typically one-handed items. Big objects are usually rifles, swords, spears, sledgehammers, requiring two hands to use them. Small objects are usually less useful in fights. If you need to carry more items, try the following techniques. The shopping cart technique. The bin method. The questionable method. The inventory is fun, functional, and one of the few inventory systems I enjoy. Because who wants to scroll through thousands of items with no sorting or being fun to use? I'm not pointing to anyone. Skyrim. This bit of war explains the history of Monogon Industries. Starting out as an audio device maker back in the 1960s called the Vocal 8. And it's still used and you can find them in radios throughout the game which I love so much. And the device is renamed through its time to Monogon Tapes and again to Monodiscs and so on and so on. In 1988 they released the first Monodisc home entertainment system called the Poly System to compete with Gammon's Kingbit gaming system and so the company war started on who will dominate the market. In 1990 they discovered the Voidway and reissued the Poly System to now be powered by this Void technology. With the Voidway discovered they began to create the world of old MythOS, only two years later becoming the rebrand as we know as Monogon Industries. Now the primary focus is to create this virtual reality world. With this push, Monogon is everywhere, in every household. This monopoly from communication to household to even education, wearables, and basically everything else in the real world and virtual. Old MythOS being updated to MythOS, which is powered by the artificial intelligence Voidmine, which invents and creates the generations for itself. The city we wonder is incomplete, 
but Monogon has planned for MythOS to be launched for customers one year from what's happening now in Boneworks. MythOS City has six key features for its use in this order. One, core system architecture. Two, commerce. Three, libraries and framework. Four, system security. Five, administrative services. Six, virtual science. This is so MythOS is all encompassing virtual space to accommodate for all your needs. Made by AI, basically making the metaverse for Zuckerberg to steal the idea 30 years later. But Monogon is not the only company to discover the Voidway. Gammon, which is a company that's a primary hardware supplier for a lot of devices back in the day. They even used the Voidway to create the Duck Season cartridge, which gave it its curse properties that you will eventually experience while playing it. And we know the dog in Duck Season, the Voidway gave it sentience. Gammon gave Arthur Ford the USB device to sabotage MythOS system by halting the clock and crashing the system, locking all the employees out. We can only assume that Gammon is trying to take down the competition, but has never specified by what means. But as we progress through the game, we find out Ford's motivations. The way the virtual world works here is users can't access the raw files of the Voidway to protect the system from tampering or unnatural properties that it can do. We see Ford's headset being heavily modified to bypass a lot of those failsafes. And to maintain a connection inside MythOS even after Gammon's USB activation, when we're archiving at the start of the game, saving items to be used later in the system or to remove strange creations by the void. When Ford touches the Gammon's USB device, it activates, starting to work its magic. The duck season clock we find in the break room is stuck at 3.14 and everyone is booted from the system, giving Ford the perfect opportunity to travel to the time tower and make sure no one gets in its way. But unexpected, it resulted in the void leaking and causing the system lockdown. Quarantining the road, forcing you to make a detour. This must be the best museum I've ever been to because they give you a gun. Or it might be standard for them to do it, I don't know, I've never been to an American school. They also have vending machines where you use ammo as a currency, so it must be American or something. Normally these vending machines are at the start of a level, allowing you to purchase items that will help you or unlock things throughout the level. Maybe one day I can afford to live off something other than beans. You can also put the items into the archiving well, which you unlock and can play with in sandbox mode or spawn into your current play. You can unlock these by finding hidden items throughout the levels. Could be weapons, balls that contain larger objects or anything in that case. Before moving on to the next area, if you put an object to prevent the doors from completely closing behind you. So you can come back from the next room, which is the gun range, and you can unlock all those items by just chucking them in the well. Otherwise you have to collect them manually through all the levels, only be able to collect five at a time and there are 140 items. So unless you want to play the game 28 times minimum, this will give you a good head start on those hoarding habits. I've spent clearly over 200 plus hours in this game and I still haven't collected everything. When inside the gun range, I like to grab a bin, then go around to each of the sections and just shove them into it. A pistol? Nice. A rifle? Don't mind if I do. Homeless person? Now I own you. Then head back and throw all your garbage into the well. Now if you didn't throw all the guns into the archiving well, they're actually a beauty. Now Brandon Latch, the director of Boneworks, really likes guns. He has a channel explaining the details for these firearms and the fetish she has. I'm sure he gets intimate with them as soon as the cameras are off. Which is probably why with combat, the guns are the most polished. To the weight, recoil, it's all appropriate to the firearms making the small ones less powerful and easy to use with just one hand. However, when shooting this bad boy, not using two hands will result in missing all your shots, giving you consent to manhandle it. And this pure satisfaction of cocking back the slide is on another level. Regarding the reloading, it's not pressing the R key to reload and seeing the animation do it for you. You have to physically reload it like in everything else in this game. Ejecting the mag, grabbing a fresh new one on your waist, lining it up and inserting it, then cocking back the slide. If you feel like looking dumb 90% of the time, you can even do reloading tricks. As you proceed to throw the mag into the air to land into your gun, only for it to miss. 
Although the guns aren't polished as in pure gun simulators, like hot dogs, horseshoes and hand grenades, it's still a good start with the direction of simplifying the gun. With all this, it's still easy to mess up the reloading under pressure and dropping the mag or the gun while fighting off off-brand headcrabs. This is exciting, with the implement of human error, it was adrenaline fueling and fun when I messed up. I mean, when I'm out of ammo, I just end up hitting them with the gun anyway. All the guns are great and I personally enjoy using the pistols, slowing down time and pretending to be an agent from the Matrix. We've all talked about bullets being used as currency. But I know this might sound crazy, but did you know you can throw them as well? When you've acquired the bullets, the only way to lose them is to either shoot the round or to eject the live round with reloading. So dropping a mag won't reduce your ammo, giving you an endless supply of ammunition to throw at them. Enemies, once defeated, don't drop anything, so there's no incentive in killing them other than a bit of breathing room. So rather save your bullets so you can recreate Jetpack Jack. Now the melee is a bit harder to get immersed in. It's a lot harder to convince my brain that this object is heavier when I'm not feeling the weight of it in real world. It's just a feeling of weightlessness of heavy objects that just get me out of the immersion. This is not the issue with any of the lighter objects, using them feel great. Sometimes worryingly too great. Blunt objects feel amazing, my favourite is the pan. But for those with a spare $3,000, you can use the golden pan. Stabbing is smooth as hell. But that's where the fun stops. There is no slashing or slicing the enemy. Body dismemberment is not in the game, I know. Sorry, George Lucas. When swinging at something, it acts the same as a blunt object. Very disappointing. 0 out of 10. Broke the immersion. There is a mod for a dismemberable Ford, so you can still inflict your psychopathic fantasies on the poor man. With the enemies relying on physics for movement and attacking, they don't follow a script when you attack them, making them unpredictable and you can't rely on an attack animation to avoid it. Let's take the Nullman, this is perfect for showing how it all works. If I was to damage let's say here, then those polygons are now broken. If I was to damage enough of it, then I won't be able to use that part of her body. What I like doing is to cap their knees so they don't respawn, but they also can't run after me and touch my stack track factory new, now reselling for $400, you know, new gun. I do think we need better enemies when it comes to melee. Melee is fine with 1-3 to three enemies, but when it's more, it just becomes a mess of them flailing their arms at you. Maybe you're supposed to primarily use the guns. Regardless, they did make a good start with the first melee VR game. At the end of the day, I still enjoy the melee combat, it's a lot of fun. Moving on to the next area, we're introduced to one of the most important elements of this world, the Void. Here Void Energy is explained, and to sum it up, it said Void Energy is a chaotic matter that is the foundation in which Mytho West stands on, and is everywhere and holds the virtual world together. If unchecked, the Void is unimaginably dangerous and should be handled with extreme caution. So naturally, after learning this, I went to touch it as if I'm trying to find the secret of Wolfenstein. Resulting in my death. Oh nice, okay yeah, does it advertise. There are three rooms left, one explaining about time control, the other about gravity, and we can skip them for now. The last room being a gift shop where you can buy a 12-sided dice with no numbers on it. Now with that room explored, the last thing left is to throw yourself into the trash. After landing in paradise, it's announced but also from observation the Nullmen have been deactivated due to the lockdown, lying around with no life left in them. I'm sure most people felt the same way during the past years. Not to worry, this is the perfect opportunity for you to practice how to be a human when this is all over. 
After admiring the playground and this beauty of a tether ball, posters are scattered around warning us about Nalman gaining sentience. This is done through the voidway and it explain how it can do more than just give sentience. So maybe these Nalman will become my companion throughout the game. That hope was short lived as I observed an aggressive Nalman. So naturally, instead of reasoning with it, I asked questions later by bashing its head in with a brick. So after that extremely accidental manslaughter, I disposed of the body. Don't worry guys, I've prepared for this moment by watching Breaking Bad, so I need to poison a child now. Getting so into the fights, I even punched a hole through my wall. Bro, why is my house literally cardboard? Pretending that didn't happen, we're introduced to one thing that excited me more than anything else that came before it. A basketball hoop. So naturally, I dunked the rat. The rat was not pleased, and filed a restraining order on me. Now I'm not allowed 100 meters within this rat. Finding more Nullman, I immediately did what any sane person would do. I proceeded to punch another hole in my wall. Ow. 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 Now turrets are just turrets. Unlike every other thing inside the system, it doesn't really have a lot of lore. We first observe from the cafeteria that the system is reeling out omni projectors to deal with the oddities, taking out all the nullmen in sight with ease. The omni projectors are the real world's equivalent of Sable Lake security force acting like Myth OS's immune system. Don't be fooled, they are no friends because of your modifications to the game your third party headset, and with the system on lockdown, you are also viewed as an oddity within the system. They will not hesitate to eliminate you. In the cafeteria, we find another clipboard asking a few interesting questions, like your mum's credit card details. But the fourth question will go over new players' heads. And those who have completed the game will understand what they're talking about with communications with extra dimensional entities, or at least an understanding of the void way. For even new players, this question will still stand out. When we first read about the Void Mind AI, it was very dismissive in the museum as if Monogon using it as jargon about AI as an escape goat if anything went wrong in MythOS. And looking through everything, it was only ever mentioned once. Here in a clipboard, it refers to a Turing test, which is created by Alan Turing in 1950s to test whatever or not a machine or artificial being is conscious or self-aware and the intellect equivalent of a human's or superior. The way this is done is through a series of tests where unseen people are having a conversation online and if replaced with the being, the results wouldn't be too different than before. Now, a lot of learning bots nowadays pass that test. Now you have to reassess that cat girl you've been talking to on Discord probably isn't who they are. Oh, For those who might recognize this next question, we'll do so from Blade Runner when they're trying to detect if the person in question is a replicant or not, which indicates this is not an isolated occurrence. Here we are given our first firearm to defend myself. Now, I feel a lot safer with this. No more do I have to get into a scrap and have to defend myself with a knife like a true British man. But now I can defend myself in the most patriotic way. While almost falling into even more garbage, we're introduced to our first character, Hans. We're informed that Hans is a security engineer for Monogon, contacting us from the real world amazed we still have access to MythOS. Because this is the first time we're informed that all Monogon employees have been kicked and locked out of the system. While everyone's freaking out, he suggests to restart with a frozen clock, as it might have something to do with it, or at least help diagnose the problem. Little does he know, we caused all this. Hans is perfect to represent the first time players and the world beyond. Not knowing what's even happening or our motives. For those who figured everything out, Good on you, just hold off for a bit, I'm getting to it, come on, don't spoil it for the rest of us. Oh no, a fate worse than death. Messages and symbols all around warning us about the Brazilian fire. But when getting caught by the trash collector, it's easy to escape just by going to the corner. Here I realise, strangely enough, there is no fall damage. Ha. Huh. Symbols and messages can be found throughout the game. 
And if you were anything like me, you wouldn't know what half of these even mean. Unless you're an SCP fan, then you'll recognize them. If you don't know what SCP is, I don't blame you, it's full of 12 year olds anyway. It stands for Secure, Contain, Protect, Foundation, and it's all about paranormal, aliens, demons, and so on. And we can only assume that these messages are from X. And since the SCP does not exist in Ford's reality, we can only assume that this is for us and not for Arthur Ford. Meaning X or other entities can bypass through the fourth wall. There are other entities than X, but the rest have no interest in us or are out to get us. But we can safely say X is out to help us. But with Boneworks being only the second game, we don't yet know what this all means just yet. There are lots of written messages to help, encourage or discourage Ford from completing his goal. Not all the writing is towards Ford, as we can see messages down with Monogon and Melonbelly was written by Nullman that have gained sentience, with them being enslaved to work for Monogon and trapped in MythOS. The Nullman gain sentience after coming into contact with Melonbelly. They become obsessed with this new drink, casting away the old one being Ultramersion. There being another rival between Melonbelly and Ultramersion. One drink is trying to trap you here, the latter is a person after watching 10 seasons of Walking Dead. Jesus, that's a month I'm never going to get back. Completing another fun non-linear puzzle, either laying down planks or climbing across. We are then yeeted into the office blocks, where we then finish off the level. In the runoff level, we're given a gun from another Ford. What? Well, this is really strange. We know that other entities exist inside the system, like X, but X leaves a calling card when showing us something. There are writings all around us telling us how to complete something, or have a higher success rate or effectiveness in doing it. There are also messages discouraging us, telling us not to complete our goals, as if there is something which we do not know just yet. Going back to the SCP, there's also symbols giving us those clues. We know R. Ford's motivation is to get to the Voidway, to become immortal. This could be another Ford that has achieved immortality before us, giving us a helping hand so we can also achieve this goal. At this point, we don't know why, but whatever it is, they want more Fords to have a higher success rate in reaching the Void if it's messages or other means. So this version of Ford is aware of other versions of himself and the Void connects all realities so time and space have no meaning when inside the Voidway. If Ford achieves this goal, he is not restricted to space-time. We are also advised to get out of Mythobus, stating there is a danger coming for us in the real world. As Sabre Lake Security have been brought in to investigate the situation, for the Fords that failed or haven't achieved the Voidway just yet to quickly get out, but what if achieving the Voidway has some sort of hellish consequences we have not foreseen, as we are warned many times about the Void and to turn back? We can also observe a Void looking entity for the first time in this level, watching us. At first we could think it's just another anomaly. But now we can say these are Fords that have achieved the Voidway. And the Ford that gave us the gun is a Ford that hasn't reached the Voidway just yet. These are not the only Fords we come into contact with. We also have these strange zombies that are normally found around melon belly products. The zombies we're presented with are widely known as Ford zombies, which are animated husks from dying in or out of virtual reality, or entering the voidway either way, leaving a shell behind to be animated. But it's even stated they are corrupted from their addiction to melon belly products. But not all Fords become zombie Fords, and there are six outcomes for a Ford. 1. Fords can stay in Fantasyland, becoming another one enjoying their peaceful life until I want to, you know, just come and slaughter them. 
Two, they could become further immersed and become a VR junkie through unknown methods, possibly crablets. Three, drinking a lot of melon belly products, becoming an addict, also corrupting them into a zombie ford, which is also four and five. Leaving a husk behind through dying or ascending into the ford to be animated later into a ford zombie. But the fords in Fantasyland are also reanimated husks. They haven't turned, being evident, melon belly products is present in the area, also consumed, but is limited to the drink, so they haven't become addicted to it. When we wake up for the first time in Fantasyland, we can see a Ford just starting to wake up right in front of us. But starting out very limited, only after watching our Ford's action does the animated Ford activate full movement. And at last, six, Fords that turn back and leave Mytho West before any of this happens. We know Melon Belly is a drink with strange properties, but if we look at the label, it stated that hand-grown melons are fermented in a time pod for infinity extracted with pure light. And when they talk about pure light, it's actually void light. After these strange properties of giving your slave sentience and raising the dead, which is probably why melons are illegal inside Mytho West. Damn it. But the melons only started becoming illegal after when people started fermenting them in the void light and so on and so on. The Great Melon War. But it doesn't matter if you're a Nullman or a Ford. All entities after becoming an addict to it will become corrupted. After a lore update, they revealed who taught the Nullman how to make the melons. The Lava Gang, which is a group of people responsible for a lot of the mods for Boneworks, and were written in to have taught the wireframe people how to ferment the melons. Before then, Monogon was actually selling Nullman melon extracts with experimental melons, exploiting the poor wireframe people with the tainted supply. But just because they taught how to ferment the melons doesn't mean Lava Gang or the Nullman are responsible for the melon belly supply, only learning more further into Ford's journey. Corrupt Nullmen are results of nobodies that have become addicted to Melon Belly and will always be found around bootleg Melon Belly operations. Man, I should really start dealing melons. Sounds like everyone's getting into that business. Jesse! Jesse, for Chris Frig, what's my melon? Jesse, this is an uprising. And our products, Jesse, our products will fulfill them. We gotta sell more melons. Gotta move these melons, Jesse. We can't keep the melons here. Hank's gonna kill me. Corrupt nobodies may look different, but aren't as far gone as zombie fords. We can see the bodies splitting at the seams with void energy, and the corrupt nullman is all contained inside the bodies, and since crablets still deem them suitable hosts, they will attack them. The zombie fords being so full of energy, some can even throw energy bolts if needed. From chat logs, we find that nullmen have been breaking in to steal lights to grow melons, which is annoying since they have to replace the glass every day because of it. Now, these little buggers will relentlessly grab onto your face like grandma during the holidays. If you accidentally let these discount headcrabs latch onto your face, you'll see another world until you realize it's on my face, oh my god! So at this point, you're inside a virtual world, inside another virtual world, inside an even another virtual world, should have added one more level, then I could have made an Inception Limbo joke. Don't let it molest your face for too long, because while you're being immersed, these blade arms are slicing up your neck. They will even do it to each other. To be honest, this looks less like fighting, and more like forceful repopulation. And so the mating begins. As the crabs are getting ready for- Oh bruh, you just killed your spouse. Uh, violence is not okay. The crablets are Mytho West headsets come to life. Their primary goal is to further immerse a client further into Mytho West. They will attack you and other Fords attaching themselves to the Ford to create VR junkies. They will not attack zombie Fords or other Voidway sentient creatures without being provoked. Maybe it's because the zombie Fords are so corrupted by the Voidway they have become unrecognizable as a suitable host to immerse. Zombie VR junkies are not unheard of since we come across them in the tower rave party and if we take a look they behave in a strange way. 
Going back to the crablets, Monogon's headsets are being tampered with by Saber Lake. We don't know if they're doing it on purpose, or the tampering accidentally causing the headsets to reassign and become the crablets, or it's a new self-reassigning headset that Saber Lake is misusing. Regardless, Saber Lake is the cause of the crablets. If it's the former, then Monogon's being exploited by Saber Lake by creating the crablets. But if it's the latter, Monogon is malicious, trying to further immerse its clients in MythOS through the use of the new self-assigning headsets. And Saber Lake is just merely misusing it. Which clarification outside of the game is needed? For which one of the two is correct? To find that it's the latter, that this is a new Monogon self-assigning headset. Showing us Monogon doesn't have clean hands with a malicious intent being brought into light. Other than a bunch of lore, the runoff level has a few puzzles and lots of combat. And to conclude this level, to go even deeper by entering the sewers. Welcome to the sewers. Here you will be on edge the entire time or hardly being able to see allowing for creatures to jump out at you at every corner. Here we are greeted to another character, Alora. Riddle me this, what's green? Shut up, time for more lore. Any death in MythOS results in a resurrection inside the operating system. Arthur discovers an exploit within MythOS system to transfer his mind into the void to achieve immortality. To do this, he must shut down the resurrection field. With that in mind, Ford begins the entire event of Boneworks. One way to take down the resurrection field is to reset the clock. This exploit is not widely known, not even Monogon knows of this. But Ford is not the only one to have discovered this. Alora, the encryption specialist, first contacts us telling she also knew about the exploit. Even before Ford, but is upset Ford acted on it first. She doesn't know about Ford's motivation yet, but has some idea of the Void's capabilities of immortality, but doesn't fully understand what is required. Ford learns of this vulnerability when talking to Hans about Gammon's access to the Voidway, and how they aren't securing a pathway to enter the Void Gate, resulting in the events. This conversation that results in this game it can be found in the Duck Season clipboard. Alora can also be viewed as a player reacting to the events, and Hans represents the world and everyone, what they're trying to know and what's happening about MythOS. She realizes Ford's plans post-reset will result in nobody being able to follow in his footsteps. And pleads for Ford to leave a way back in. But Ford doesn't care. What a chad. The process will destroy the system because restarting the clock in a damaged state will not restore it to full function. And is evident with the shockwaves when starting the clock's core is damaging the environment and finally its inhabitants with falling debris and glitches as the world begins to fail. The Nullmen were pulling out the gravity cores out of the clock, regardless if they were trying to open a void door or another goal, it released a void pro mode that was being controlled by the clocks and the cores. It's most likely the Nullmen were doing this to escape the prison of MythOS, but hopefully opening a void gate or a door of some sort. The Void Gate has been mentioned in Duck Season by Nyan the Cat, which they use them to move around, and pure speculation, the cat symbol on the Melon Buddy products is the cat, and the melon fermentation in the Void was taught to the Nullman by someone. So has this all been Nyan's plan to get into Boneworks? Which would fit great since it was stated that the cat represents time and the monkey represents trickery. The cat frees time with the clock and the monkey tricked the Nullman? This was the consensus until they dropped an update telling us the lava game taught the Nullman and the cat. Yeah, it turns out so many fought there as well. They had to implement an actual cat symbol so he wouldn't get confused and informed us that this was a rabbit all the time. They added on the street level a cat as a reference. Tell me, tell me that's not a cat. Here, I got you covered. Just extend the ears. Mm -hmm. And there you go, I fixed the issues and now I'm wanted for defacing a logo. I mean, at least I didn't draw the Illuminati or Among Us on it. Oh god, what have I done? We find out a female has been smuggling melon belly onto the trains and employees have been paid to basically look the other way. And to state, melon belly is not partnered with Monogon or Ultramersion. 
this unknown woman supplying Melon Belly into the city, but the only female we're introduced to in this entire thing is Allura. Allura does reference contribution as maybe she's referring to a bribe or referring to Melon Belly, but there's not enough information to be 100 on that. Learning about the night vision, first time playing, I didn't know about the night vision goggles. Because I tried them on on levels with lights and nearly got blinded with green. So I was a little spooked feeling around in the dark, on edge, waiting for something to just lunge out at me when I couldn't see. In this game, you have two options for light sources, night vision goggles or flashlights. Both having their perks and handicaps. For the flashlight, requiring one of your hands make you reloading and melee difficult at the least. A nice feature is that you could put it in your pocket, with the light creating a cone of visibility on the floor. But this is not very useful apart from finding grass. I only touched a bit on void forwards. To restate, we've had messages to encourage and help or discourage and warn us about reaching our goals. When we first observe a void forward, he looks very compulsing and spazzing as if in pain or merely corrupted. Either way, it doesn't look good what's happened to them. The composer for Boneworks' original soundtrack, or Bone Tunes, is Michael Wackoff. You might know him as Riot, and has a lot of songs and very immersive. If I had to pick the top three, it would be Theme Song, Opera, and Pick It Up. You can find the full original soundtracks on YouTube on Michael's channel. He also has a video explaining the creations and process of making the soundtrack. And music is just one of those things that drive emotions. It's very easy to manipulate somebody into feeling a way with it. And there's no other medium that brings people together more than music. Also, the madman even hid pictures and messages inside the harmony. Boneworks would not be the same without a soundtrack. and tells you more about the world than any dialogue. It all works so well together. Gameplay, music, map creation, it just all forms this masterpiece. And a side note, us Boneworks enjoyers are called boners, not, not even joking. Now what does this all mean? The music part, not the boner bit. Well, if you look at the zombie soundtrack, we find this. Send help, I'm trapped in the void. Now we're led to believe that's forward, and if so, there must be some hellish consequence when you disconnect your consciousness from your physical body, resulting in us becoming one of these entities that you just want to escape, but you can't. Also, if you haven't picked it up by now, the creators of Boneworks just grab the name Void and add it to everything. We just have Void Energy, Void Light, Void Gate, and every other English word with just the word Void in front of it. Why couldn't I just call it Mysterious Liquid? or magic hole, you know, just to spice up their vocabulary. On this level, we see our first big melon operation and corruption taking place. All right, spooky level over. Time for some of the most fun levels. This, this is one of the best levels designed, and I'll cover now being in its due place, allowing you to approach it in many ways. The most commonly is through the front, by using the battery which you can obtain by taking the least resistance by going round clockwise, but you can also collect your prize going anti-clockwise if you so choose. Then using the ramp to enter the facility, but there are advantages for taking other routes other than spicing it up. 
could take another route for saving time, for speedruns, avoiding all the enemies, or just being that one person trying to be quirky. When handling with the terrain, not only that, you can interact with the items in different ways. It might not be groundbreaking to have your fingers tracked, bluntly it doesn't change anything in the game. But being able to see your fingers in-game giving it a tiny bit of push for immersion? I mean, we are physically visual creatures. With virtual being already established in VR, hand haptics will be big, and I don't mean a vibrator in a controller. When the game came out in 2019, the Valve Index was advertised all over the place, showing its technological achievements compared to my cardboard VR. And when it was finally released, I was so excited for the first commercial hand trackers at the time. Oh, oh look, it doesn't ship to my country. What if I buy it from a country? Oh, it's even more expensive than the current price of fuel. Woo, free shipping though. So I then decided to make some VR gloves. Wow, look how immersive it is. Being able to track each finger and feel the object is what I would say if the damn thing didn't fall apart like my sanity. Okay, okay. If you're feeling lonely at any point of the game, just with some extra code, you now have Boneworks multiplayer, multi-bones. So you now have the capability to interact with other boners. It's just like VR chat, but with physics, and better yet, it doesn't have the mirror problem. Let's investigate the cause of the problem of people spending thousands of dollars just to sit in front of a mirror. Burb. Excuse me, individual. Why do you think everyone in VR chat is attracted to miners? I mean mirrors. Little cutie. Yeah. Not kidding, that person wasn't a plant. And I tried asking the question four times. I was expecting a WTF moment. But I got the stereotypical VR experience. Where three of the times, people with not safe for work avatars just showed up and interrupted the interview. Which I won't show for obvious reasons. And the fourth time being where The reason I'm telling you this is so you know what happened if I suddenly had a breakdown. The game lacks in any progression storytelling really, so after talking about the game mechanics good at the start, not much to really talk about. So I'll spare you the dread of time wasting and get to the point. Sableg struggling to control the outbreak of common bots redirecting you to some kid's diss track? This game is not long, with the first time playing it clocking in at around 15 hours to complete. But if I speed run it, I could possibly top the charts, but since I'm so humble, I'll let someone else to prove it for me. Someone who's a bit more cracked, like MatPat. Worrying about my mental health, I only discovered a key feature of the game only on my third playthrough. And I'm of course talking about the Vine Fudd sound effect. With the power of cringe, merely playing the MP3, reality begins to slow to the mental speed of politics, allowing us to shoot anyone who thinks different. Oh guys, water is- no, no politics. Central Station being notorious for having a lot of everything, entire areas of surveillance by turrets, warehouses of crablets, trains, Yep, they have those. Tunnels? It could be with game design, or my own inability to comprehend the intellectual masterpiece that is this level, that most of the time, I just end up at the same spot, multiple times, always with a key that I never find a door for. The tower shows us the chaos we caused with the remains of Mytho West. It's a battleground with the last line of security, finding of all the creatures that have been drawn to the tower. You'll be attacked from anywhere, by everyone, with many enemies you have to deal with. You could sit and watch till the war is over for them to deal with each other, but what's the fun in that? Although it's a bit resource hungry, not even my microwave could handle processing how much is happening. 
It does become better as you proceed to murder everyone inside while looking for keys. Good thing when the game removes unnecessary items when your PC is struggling, like ragdolls, that's a very cool feature. Doesn't help these boys have multiple lives, so the frame rate won't improve after every kill though. Which is good because if they decided to have all of the AI all at once, I'm sure my PC would just melt. You do have access to a shopping cart and you could do some skating and cool tricks with those. Yo, this is Arthur Ford and I'm about to do a kickflip, son. Yeah. After dealing with that kerfuffle, we could also find a rave while progressing through. That's because they are zombie fords that have become further immersed into the system by crablets. And altogether, they form the VR junkies. And I know I love the song Pick It Up, but I absolutely love this one song only found here. I thought nothing of it, and in the past I absolutely loved playing with it. Only later finding out that it's a reference to one of their past games, Hover Junkies. I mean, it's not like the Hover Junkie vehicle gave it away or anything. The song is Outlaw, for those who are wondering. Also, good luck trying to get the hover vehicle into the archiving well. It was a real challenge. Also, you can blow out the vehicle, so don't have it on full for any long amounts of time. Otherwise, it just won't work anymore. From now on, clipboards in the tower level and all clipboards after are blank. Currently, maybe in the new installments of the franchise that will add more to it. But yeah, that it concludes this level. Finally, your entire journey has led up to this moment. Honestly, I got chills. The atmosphere and the music gave it this creepy cult feeling that just resonates here. Fighting with the Nalman was honestly one of the best moments. You do have to shoot the gravity cores into place, which is kind of annoying when the enemies spawn to interrupt you. So quick tip, grab all the cores, line them up with all the cannons and then shoot them all. The enemies will only start spawning after you put the first one in, allowing yourself not to even have to deal with any of that. Oh yeah, we also have one of the best items you can purchase in the vending machine. Yeah, you have the normal things, but we're introduced to the physics tools and weapons. These physics items can change the smallest things. You're probably asking, does this make me god? Yes, with this newfound power you can travel anywhere, change the environment. Make those without power fight for your entertainment. Yes, fight for me. Fight for my approval. Or you can stick this to anything forever. Damn it, I can't get it off me. Help. The clock detonating after inserting the last core. And Fawn respawns in the back rooms. Hmm. Oh, hello, yes! I mean, the back end. As planned, surrounded with void energy with a door boarded up with the words, Welcome Home. Housing the duck season baseball with paw print for the handle, and all these melons also. A headset when put on has the most discouraging messages telling you this is your last chance to get out. But to enter the door and avoid the void, finally avoid ghost watching us. 
and again looking to be strange behaviour shaking and spazzing, almost in pain, or abyss lost of itself. They seem to have no physical contact with Mythos world, nor communication, and can only observe. This being a turning point as we have moved from our body into the virtual self, we are left defenseless. It's not stated if we have any connections to our body or we just right out cut from it, unable to return if we so choose. You awaken in someone's basement, trapped behind bars. Come on, why does this keep happening to me? Let me out! Let me out! This is not a dance! I'm begging for help! I'm screaming for help! Please come let me out! You there handsome fellow, let me out. Oh, you're mimicking me? Oh, he, he's obviously a psychopath. I must deal with this in the most appropriate manner. Oh, that's too bad. It rolled heads. This is probably why they locked me up. Well, too late. I must be the only Ford. The Battle of the Fords, Fortnite Edition. Ending up here in Fantasyland, we have successfully left Mythos West City, but we are still in Mythos West system, as Hans and Alora can still contact us, and all other computers are still running on that system. As I progress through the level, I don't know what it is, but every time I play this specific level, for some reason there's a loud buzzing sound that's just sickening. And I've reloaded the level lots of times, uninstalled, and googled why this is happening, but can't find anything on the subject. It's just one tone, and every few minutes changes pitch. Makes the level very unenjoyable. The only way I could even play it is I had to remove my headphones, a ringing in my ear, making the rest of me feel unwell. On the subject of weird glitches, I did have this one issue with the game when I grabbed or touched something, my controller would be stuck vibrating. It had an easy fix though, I just had to grab onto something else for it to stop. Almost like it was stuck in a loop. It's never happened in any other VR games I've played, and a few other people have had this problem. So I can say that it's in the game, and since Boneworks has been out for almost 3 years, and this problem I found on day 1 is still very disappointing that they haven't solved it. Other than that, the level is very plain, not much happening really. I can't say the same about the next level. Arena is very straightforward. King Ford makes you fight for his entertainment. If we live long enough, we'll be granted an audience with his majesty himself. Even though this is what we've done a hundred times before, it's still fun. I don't know, maybe doing something over and over with your real body makes it less boring. I still love getting lost in the fight and the music while it's playing. Oh, I guess it's over. Well, I'm coming for you next, King Ford. This being the last level of the campaign, entering the house of the king. The stained glass panels depict Ford's journey and our Ford is depicted with a halo. Compared to the other Fords which are not, other entities are also depicted being the arena king, crablets, zombie Fords and other Fords. Interesting, one panel depicts our Ford being half nobody 
and the two halves are being merged, indicating possibly nobody's wants to become a Ford. We are depicted as a savior or life bringer of some sorts. Regardless, we are being worshipped. Keep in mind, we aren't the first Ford to successfully make it to the void. So this could be referring to a predecessor and we are just repeating their actions. Now, to prove ourselves, you have to fight yourself. And I don't mean this is a representation for your depression or inner demons. Come on, what do you think this is? Cry with fear? After beating the lesser you, you have obtained the crown. The crown that makes you king. And these fords, they will follow and fight for you as any good subject should. We also see, for the last time, Alora and Hans. Hans saying they found us and are coming, giving us a little bit of time to finish up. And Alora finding a USB and removing it, possibly allowing Saber Lake to even find us. Also, thanks to X for this physics weapon, we can now access the outside. Here we could find a new creature, the King Crab. It's just a big boy version of the crablet but all of that can be ignored as we run for our lives to the final destination no boss battle or puzzle just you and this ladder to reach the end and it's just fitting that this is how it ends reaching the top we are shown the final piece of our story We are shown Saber Lake breaking into the room where we lie motionless, securing the area as a blurred out faced man enters, with a slow zoom out revealing void entities are watching what's happening, only for us to look around in virtual space to see they are also here watching us. The blurred out person pulling out a pistol, shooting us in the back of the head with the boneworks door closing on us, and concludes Ford's story. Now the person shooting us I've heard has been called G-Man, yep you heard me right. No I don't think it's the G-Man from the Half-Life universe, but I wouldn't put it far off since this was intended to be in the universe. Yeah I don't think the one Black Mesa cup in the office can confirm this to be the case, but G-Man does gesture to the void forward signaling there is more to it. Oh well. Now Ford's already reached his goals. Once exiting MythOS system and jumping into the outside, we have officially severed your connection to your physical Ford, leaving the body behind as a husk. Now, what if I told you this game I've been talking about for the last how many minutes could not be a game at all? It could actually be a tech demo. It's been hinted several times that it is, but it's never been truly stated if it is. It could very much be a tech demo with the lack of storytelling, being a bit short and being hyped that way from pre-launch. One reason people call their product a tech demo is to shield it from criticism of lack of content, which Boneworks doesn't fall short of. Almost like, oh, you didn't like our game? Well, it's not about the game. It's about what we can do, like a lot of so-called game tech demos out there for VR. Regardless, if Boneworks is a tech demo, it's on its own league. You think it ends there? Oh boy, you're surely mistaken, but I'll quickly run past them. There are other levels that are considered canon. You can find and unlock these through the campaign and enable them in the main menu wall. Fantasy Arena is your typical sandbox arena map. Yes, it's the arena level just slammed into a different mode. This map is what you'll see every VR news tuber using the same clip over and over again Maybe it's because they're so lazy they can't film other ones. This is your Call of Duty zombie survival game. Yep, that explains basically this entire game mode. Kill zombies, get points, use points to buy stuff like equipment or areas. Then cure all the zombies showing us there's still hope for saving the zombies as we could turn them back into fords. And one singular piece of dialogue happens when doing it. 
for Fords already know us. They might know us from the Ford religion in the throne room level, with our form being depicted in stained glass. Still strange. Oh, it's you! This is just a map to play around with, with an extra room. This is literally just the empty version of the museum basement. Welcome to the land of Tuscany, where butterflies will explode when touched, just like YouTubers. Very cool map. Very cool map. It has nice music as well. Out of the many levels, this is the one of the few that has anything going on within it. The chamber is a recursion loop, and those who don't do coding, I'll try sum it up. A loop will repeat a block of code as many times as specified, you'll have to put parameters. For example, if I ask you to count to 20 starting at 0, well, plus in 1 every time it looped, you could probably write it as fast as you're writing the loop code. But if you wanted to count to 20,000, it will be faster than writing out each equation. It would be silly and take forever to write down 20,000 individual equations. You could have the loop print out each variable of the equation when executed. What I explained is the basics of a loop. Now a recursion loop is basically the same as a loop, but will keep looping until it has its result required without any parameters and are often used in mathematical factorials to help solve. But if the outcome is not met, this means it can loop forever. Which is not a good thing, because if designed poorly, but when it comes to actual programming, every time it looped, it will use up more and more memory, growing with no end in sight. Resulting in programming leaks, errors, crashes, or even corruption. When completing the redacted chamber, you'll see this is the case. It loops, the enemies will change, becoming harder, items changing, and things getting more messy. Showing us corruption or errors of the recursion loop. Recursion loops are great if done correctly for learning and adapting. Instead of loops, which is just mass plugin inputs until it reaches its goal, Recursion loops can explain about Ford's journey with all the messages he gets. The previous loop telling us how to get a little bit further to completing the goal. And some loops even helping us a bit more by giving us a gun like we saw in the campaign. Moving away from there, shifting these crates will reveal a hole in the wall where the men see it all. And what we see is another Ford playing around inside another chamber. When I first saw this, I thought this was a repeat from my actions, only to realize this is a pre-scripted texture playing on the other side. This is a fun puzzle map, almost like the campaign as you unlock sections and tools. There's even a time shooting course to see how fast you can get all 45 targets coming out with the lowest time. While progressing, you'll recover areas with harder and harder enemies as you backtrack. Yep, this was a good addition to the game, glad I added it here. It's nice that they added a hover junkers map, it's a nice change. No combat, nothing, the goal is to make it to the other side using the wasp. With this challenge, it could be really relaxing or the most stressful thing. Colliding with anything will render the vehicle useless. You'll have to walk the entire map, which could take a long time. All within the respected universe. Now, mods. You used to be able to get mods from Bonetone.com, but it was shut down around 2020. Fear not, since the catalog migrated to Thunderstore.io. Just select Boneworks and choose one of their delicious mods. 
download, extract the files and slap that bad boy in the Boneworks folder. I'm afraid for a lot of his mods to work, you'll need to download Melon Loader. And you can find the exact instructions on the website. You will need to download a mod for custom maps or avatars, but they follow the same steps as mod that is not mod for installation. You can join their active Discord group to keep track of mods keeping you up to date with new releases and updates, so what? If that's your jam, go right ahead. That was the longer and older way to download. There's another way to download mods that is way easier. The reason I didn't inform you about this first and showed you how to download the mods manually was this bit of software didn't want to work on my laptop no matter how many times I threw it onto the ground. I did manage to get this to work a few hours later on another device, so if you run into the same issue, my tip here is just buy another computer. If you did get it to work, I recommend using this. It's called R2 Modman, and it's a great bit of software which does all the manual downloading for you. You can update, disable, or even uninstall all the mods within here, which is very convenient compared to the first method of modding. Now let's test the mods. When inside the game, you can access your mods using the mod is not mod mod. Using your B button on your controller, it gives you a new icon called bone menu, and it's a touchscreen. Now what mod I would 100% can't live without is the camera plus. It increases your POV from this to this, and allows you to move into spectator mode for cinematic shots. Now, with the power of the mods, you can now become Spider-Man swinging from rooftop to rooftop. You can even reenact Meet for Spy. Slaughter younglings. Or go to the furry convention next door. And before you know it, I'll have more mods than Skyrim. All this allowing the game to be even greater than before, so enjoy. That's all I'm going to cover with the mod section without spending 10 hours explaining each mod. Even though a lot of this video is grounded within this game, I'll sadly have to say since some of the information I've acquired outside of the games, like in interviews or chats, I have to say this is all an interpretation from the information I've been presented with. Because I've reached out to the devs to check what I'm saying isn't just a crackhead talking about the birds that aren't real. Yeah, me and every other FNAF channel. Shockingly enough, they didn't respond, I know. This is mind blowing. Playing Boneworks, it doesn't matter if you've never played it before or already played it. Now, it's not a demo, shut up. You must play it because I give it the highest rated out of all the other VR games. And if you don't have a VR, go bug somebody who does. I'm sure as soon as you stop feeling motion sickness, you have a blast. It doesn't matter what your stances are for VR. This game will change your mind on VR and you will come out of this as a fully developed VR user. The story, however, will get a bit lost on it. Like you really have to go digging for it. Like. I don't see us ever getting a final cut on what's happening from the history with storytelling. I see this being left up to your imagination. As we look back on Boneworks, we'll forever be an interesting footnote in VR history. Thanks. And that's my TED talk on how boners work. While recording this video, Stress Level Zero decided to announce the upcoming sequel to Boneworks called Bone Labs. For what we are told, you can see you are in Mythal West journeying into a hidden research facility. Cool thing is that they'll release it for Quest users right out of the gate. But the big thing that stands out is the inclusion of inbuilt support for mods, which is always great to see. The one thing I do have issues with is the Nullman looking like the progression of simplification logos. Let me guess, the next game the Nullman are going to look like this. Let me run down some of the confirmed information slash changes we know that's going to be in this new release. It's going to be 33% campaign, 33% mods, 33% sandbox, and 1% other. Damn, squid game. When starting a game, you roll a six-sided dice to be assigned one of the body types. 
Each bodies will have different physical capabilities. Small be quick, light making you agile for parkour and speedruns. Speaking of parkour, you can see an entire area dedicated to it on the wall over. But having less mass, you will struggle for having power with lifting objects or physical combat and just having lower health. Mass being more muscle. Taking the big boy, you will have the opposite effects, being slower but really tanky. And I'll bet you have enough power when punching you could just kill somebody with one punch. At the moment, the body proportions are not random, so you can't get arc survival looking characters. Unless you want to mod them in, but it said you can 3D scan yourself into the game, which is really cool. Ford will be in Bone Labs, but we won't be playing as him unless you really want to mod him in. Nice to add the shotgun from Duck Season, that's really cool. They optimize the game to load faster and use less memory, ideal for quest users. I hope they don't skip too many corners, you know, like the Null Man. There's a lot more confirmed, but I'll be entering spoiler territory if I do so, so I'll just leave that for another video. So yeah, I didn't expect the script to take this long. I can't believe three years ago I started writing this. Well, it's not as long as Subnautica. I started writing that back in 2017, but when I wrote La Game Good, they blueballed me and released the second game. But by the time I'm done with that, they will release Subnautica 3 above hot, even with a smaller map and no water. I'm sure this video would have taken longer if they didn't announce Bone Labs, so I spent many sleepless nights to give you this video essay every 9th grade English teacher would be proud of. Sorry for not uploading so much, I started experimenting with different kinds of media, so let me know if you enjoyed this kind of content. I very much enjoyed it, but it means I won't be able to pump out, out fast food. Thanks for everyone for sticking around, I really appreciate it. So yeah, hope to see you again very soon. See ya.